Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, episode 118. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with James Burstall. James is the CEO of Argonon Group and best-selling author of The Flexible Method, Prepare to Prosper in the Next Global Crisis. James, so happy to have you with me today. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much for that very warm introduction. I'm delighted to be here. It's a pleasure. And I know the bio said very little, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about yourself, your background, your story, and of course, what it is that you do. Well, I run an independent production group. That is, we make shows, primarily TV shows, but also movies. And we work for all the platforms, whether it be the streamers, such as Netflix and Amazon, or the cables like Discovery, Nat Geo, History, and so on, or uh, broadcast nets like Fox, uh, or BBC, or Channel 4 in the UK. We're headquartered in London, and we have very big offices in New York and Los Angeles. And we are a truly global group, and we are independent. Wow. So so how did you get started in all of this? You know, I, I love the creativity. Um, I'm sure that there's a piece of that in you. Um, but how, what is the backstory that brought you to where you are? Well, I've always had a career that has spanned the Atlantic. And indeed, I have family in New York. My, my, my big sister lives in New York with three nephews and nieces. So I've always had a very uh, connected US-UK uh, career trajectory, if you like. So in fact, my first job coming out of, of college um, was working for the Condé Nast Group. I was given a job by this big American organization who uh, published uh, Vanity Fair, that at the time was being edited by Tina Brown, also Vogue, uh, run by Anna Winter, and Condé Nast Traveler, run by Harold Evans. So three giants of journalism, all of whom have actually British origins, but all based in New York. And I worked for them in Paris. And that's how I started out of college. I'd started modern languages at school. So French, German, and then subsequently Italian and Spanish. And so it, for me, it was just a dream job to move to Paris and to be able to hop on a plane at any time of the day or night and go and do stories about Gorbachev or uh, um, some kind of fashion icon uh, and everything in between. You know, I've always been interested in a real broad range of, of storytelling. So I worked in journalism for several years, then came back and worked in newspapers in London. Uh, and then I decided to get into TV and I've given a break as an on-screen reporter, which was a lot of fun, actually, although very high pressure. I found I found being on camera was really tough, uh, although I enjoyed it. And it was good to learn that because, of course, subsequently I worked with a lot of A-list performers, both actors and hosts. So I do I do know what they go through. And of course, when they're on screen, they're putting themselves out there every day and the stakes are very high. So I've got a lot of empathy for that. Then I worked as a producer for many different companies, whether it's the BBC or Discovery in the US and a whole bunch of other networks. And then eventually in my mid thirties decided I want to set up my own business. So I set up a business, which from the get go was US UK. So initially our first base was in New York and London. Uh, and then more recently we opened in Los Angeles. And actually the media industry really does depend upon that access, sorry, the access between the US and the UK. We really do, um, we're market leaders, we're very good at storytelling, we have very uh, high expertise, uh, we really understand this business, and we're also very global, so we work with incredible partners all around the world. Okay, so there's a lot there that you shared, and that was a fascinating description. I, I was particularly intrigued on the front end, because you talked, if I got it right, that you studied languages, and then you moved into journalism. And it's kind of interesting because I have a number of advanced degrees. Um, I'm not as bullish on education as I once was, even though that's my career background, because I see so many people. And I think your story tells this uh, or conveys this point as well, who maybe spent a lot of time pursuing some kind of degree, maybe useful, maybe not so useful. And then they um, or they don't even do that, and then they move straight into some entrepreneurial event, event, uh, you know, venture, or find a way by which you know to make themselves successful in the workplace. And so, um, I'm I'm curious to know your transition. If it was just 
you know, being fortuitous, so to speak, where you had this background in language and somehow you wound up in journalism? Or was that the plan all along? And then I'm curious to know how you transitioned from being an employee, you know, working for other people, even though there were great people and you're learning a lot and all of that. I'm curious to know what it was that gave you the impetus to transition into starting your own company and how you felt that you had the wherewithal to do that, considering you had been moving from a very different kind of place where somebody was saying, be here, do this, meet this person, you know, pro provide this deliverable to now all of a sudden being the boss? Well, the first point, um, I mean, I'm interested in languages because I like people. I'm interested in people. And when you learn a foreign language, you can become a traveler, not a tourist. And that for me has always been a really big deal in my life. I love traveling into other people's worlds and finding out what makes them tick, understanding them. We're all different, thank goodness. We all have different priorities. We have different cultures and customs, all of which are valid and equal. And I love that. So by learning different languages, I was able to really um, broaden my mind. I am naturally garrulous. I'm naturally interested in the big wide world. Um, I come from London, which is the most incredibly cosmopolitan city um, up there, absolutely, with New York and Los Angeles and some of these other great uh, megalopoli on the planet. Um, so I am really into diversity. I'm really into the breadth and the range of different cultures that make the world tick. And thank goodness we are all so different because it would be boring if we were all the same. So that's why I think I got into learning languages. And it is the most incredible tool. It is a life tool, both in my personal and my professional life, to be able to meet people on their own ground. And I have actually done a little bit of learning in Korean, a little bit of learning in Mandarin. And I go to these places and I'm showing respect because I come from a different part of the planet. Their world is just as interesting and vital and dynamic as mine, but fundamentally, you know, in a different part of the world with different values and interests and needs. Um, and uh, that, I think, naturally led me into journalism because I do like to ask questions. I'm interested in people. And I'm interested in learning. Um, to your point about education, I have always done education. So I did a first degree in languages. Then later in life, I went to the business school at Oxford to learn about managing and leading change. Then I went to the grad school at Stanford because I wanted to understand just how important culture is. And obviously um, what is so interesting about the whole Stanford um, culture is um, they've managed to combine creativity with technology, with finance. And that's why Silicon Valley, of course, is such a world leader. And I really wanted to understand the, the combination of those three and how to leverage that. And at the heart of that, uh, and certainly what Stanford really taught me, is a positive nurturing supportive culture makes your people do better work people feel better they feel happier they feel more rounded and creative people need to feel supported and nurtured and you know what the direct result of that is it goes straight to your bottom line you look after your people you make more money that's not why i do this business i mean i am in business because i'm not a charity i want to make money i do it because i love what i do and i love the people i work with but a net benefit of all of that when you treat your people well is they will work harder for you and you become a bigger, stronger, more resilient, more sustainable business and you make more money. So it's win-win all around. Yeah, I love that. And I'm glad you mentioned it because oftentimes I do sort of uh, ask questions around leadership and culture and things like that. And I think it really is important, you know, especially in, in, in more recent times where I think uh, whether it's because of the fact that we do so much more of our work virtually, maybe not in your industry, um, or just because Definitely. of the pandemic and the way that we've reimagined work and working remotely and things like that. So I think it becomes easy to forget about the, the humanity within the workplace. And oftentimes, even people who are working face to face and see people every single day, they're so focused on the bottom line. They're so focused on what can I get out of my people? They don't necessarily think enough about how can they invest into their people? How can they provide, like you talked about, the support and the and the guidance and, and the sense of care um, because they feel like that's a waste of time or that's sort of, you know, not, not it's, it's losing focus from what's most important. And you're making the point to the opposite. So I know you, I just saw you shake your head there for a second. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you're thinking? It is an antediluvian concept that people come after the bottom line. That is just so wrong. 
I fundamentally disagree with that. People are everything. Business is not a PL. Business is a community of folks, of people, of individuals who want to come together and do something amazing. We spend a lot of time at work. We want to expand our horizons. We want to maybe change the world in the little way that we can in our little sphere. And we want to make money. We want to pay our bills. We want to feed our kids. So it's a community of people, a business. So actually, you know, I have written this book called The Flexible Method. And the first thing in that book uh, is look after your people, put your people first. They are everything. My industry is a talent business. Talent are the lifeblood of who we are and what we do. Without the talent, my business wouldn't exist. So of course people come first. I love it. And I was going to ask you about your book. So thank you for for sort of taking us there. But before we dive deeper, um, I, I have a question for you because it, it's becoming more and more in, in my line of work, I'm not quite sure what the implications will be in the coaching space or even in the educational space. So I think I'm starting to see some major uh, impacts there. But I'm curious about artificial intelligence because we are talking about people. And at the end of the day, you know, we bring our own unique creativity and 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 emotions and passion and all of that. What are the implications or what do you see coming down the pipeline specifically in your industry as it relates to AI? And what do you see on a more global sense? How worried do we need to be about things like employment, about being able to utilize our creativity in the future? How much of it do you think will be usurped by by machines? I'm just curious to get your thoughts about. I know I'm sure it's, I'm sure we could have a whole conversation exclusive just to that. But in a, just a few moments, I'm curious to get your your you know first take, if you will, on this on this matter. Well, AI is the absolute hot topic of the moment. We are seeing massive transformations and, and we're seeing constant evolution. And yesterday, Microsoft are bringing out their next iteration and it's going to go fi- quicker and faster and more and more opportunities are going to emerge. We have to be very mindful about AI. The fact is it is here and it is going to change our lives. We're already using it as a tool. In my industry, in, in the independent uh, production sector, we use it for monetization, for distribution. We are starting to use it for ideation. And, you know, the moment uh, ChatGPT and its equivalents are basically a toy because they're just really tapping into the whole of the world's knowledge in one space, which is very useful, frankly, and we use it a lot. Uh, but I'm waiting to see if we get to artificial general intelligence, which is what everyone is trying to get to now, where um, technology can actually start to think for itself. And that is going to be extraordinary. What I will say, and I am thinking about this deeply, is that human beings have a unique capacity, not only to think from the head, but to think from the heart. Emotional intelligence is a unique human gift. And when we combine that human gift with technology, and we work with AI as a very useful new tool, we can do amazing things. But it does behove us to act responsibly and to act with emotional intelligence. Also, to your point earlier, we therefore have to train our next uh, generation in how to act responsibly and to engage and use their emotional intelligence in order to frame how we utilize AI into the future. So what is it? Okay, go ahead. I didn't realize it. I was going to ask you about emotional intelligence. You mentioned it a few times. It's obviously an important topic and it's become more relevant or at least better known in the last few decades. Um, What do you do within your own company Uh, and with your people to help them to develop their EQ so that they really are, you know, first of all, developing within themselves, because not everybody comes to the table with true emotional intelligence, and also how to utilize it effectively with each other. I think you can build it into the, the, uh, the infrastructure of the business and indeed the culture of the business. So just in terms of infrastructure, my company very consciously has made sure that all the senior people are stakeholders, they have skin in the game, they either have shares or share options, they have stock in the top company. So there is a sense of commonality, we are working on something together. So already from the get go, you are establishing that there is a business built equality. Therefore, we attract a certain kind of people, people who are kind of machismo lead from the top down, and that could be men or women, they probably won't fit in our business, because that's just not how we work. And that's not how the business is structured. Then you build in a system of positive feedback, lots of communication, 
a very strong HR department where people are able to feedback and share their views, share grievances, because sometimes in the creative sector and elsewhere, people have disagreements and there's competitiveness. You know, this is normal. We're human beings. This, you know, this stuff happens. But there is always a way to work through disagreements or different points of view if you have a framework whereby different points of view are valued and explored. And then the management team has to come up with solutions and say, well, we've heard you all and we're going to make up our mind and then we take a bit of time and then we take a view that we're going to go down this road and then we pursue that path. So people feel that they have been heard. So I think there is a culture within our business of accessibility of the senior leadership and there are very strong structural opportunities within the organization on a regular basis every single month for people to feedback, to talk, to openly communicate um, and to feel that they are being heard because that's very important. So I have a question for you because I'm always curious to know how people come to the belief systems that they hold, you know, hold dear. And you've mentioned this now a few times earlier as well. We talked about having a community of people, a community of folks. Um, I wrote down a bigger pie in effect. And you talked about it more recently with the stakeholders and creating accessibility. It's not necessarily a given that leaders think in those ways. And oftentimes they think of their people Yes, they might be human capital. I have to take care of them and I value them and all of that. But I'm not necessarily thinking about equity. I'm not necessarily thinking about creating a, quote, community where I view them almost as equals to myself in their respective roles. Did you have a role model that, quote, taught you that? Is that something you observed in some of the roles you occupied before? Did you come to that on your own? Where, where What's the genesis of the thought process for you? My, my dad was a, a filmmaker. He was a, a BBC lifer. He worked there for 35 years making wonderful documentaries. And he believed very greatly in justice and equality. And he had a very, very strong social conscience. And part of the work we do, as well as doing entertainment shows like The Masked Singer and scripted comedy like Hard Sell on Netflix or reality shows uh, on HGTV like House Sunders International, which is a show about real estate. We make those sorts of shows. But in addition to that, we also do investigative work because I'm, I'm fascinated about digging deep and getting people to tell their real stories. So I think it's built into me as a human being and as a professional. I'm interested, as I said at the beginning, in other people. And when you're interested in other people, that builds you know, a natural sense of equality. I also think that as the world has evolved, this idea of kind of 1980s style, you know, director from the top gives his or her directives and everybody follows suit. And this person at the top is expected to know everything. And this person is a bit of a kind of um, an icon who has no flaws and is always right. You know, that's just such an old, outdated mode of thinking. And it's no longer fit for purpose. Um, one of my favorite quotes actually is from Bill Gates, who's, who talks about the leaders of the future are those who empower others. And I see great strength in other people. I have my strengths. I know that. I'm also human. I've got my weaknesses. And I've done lots of study actually around this. One of the things at Oxford University, who would have thought it has a completely holistic 360 approach to leadership? I didn't think that. I thought they were kind of masters of the universe in the way they thought. And there is a bit of that. It's, uh, these great, you know, I would have thought so, yeah. Schools. There is a bit of that. That's true. Mm -hmm. But actually, I was really astonished when I did my study at the grad school. It's really 360. They believe in leaders have got to look after themselves. They've got to look after their own mental health because we have huge challenges. We have to eat properly. We have to exercise. We have to look after our families, having stability at home, whatever that is right for you. Make sure that that is there so that your home is settled. And then when you come to work, you treat people with respect and you listen. Um, and I think that that is the... That is, well, to, to be honest, it's the only way I can work. I, you, you said to me earlier, you asked me a question, which I have been dying to respond to, which I will just now briefly, if I may. You said, how did I transition from working for other people, which I did as a producer for 10 years until my mid-30s, to running my own company? And you've also, of course, I've done my homework about you. I understand a little bit about your story. You've talked about how some of the failures and the difficult things can be the most important lessons. I absolutely yes. buy into that. So one of the last companies I worked for as an employee, age 34, they had a very macho top-down culture. And when they would do a deal, selling a show or distributing a show to, around the planet, they would rub their hands in glee if they're basically 
excuse my French, screwed the opposition. Mm -hmm. They would be delighted if they thought that they had come out on top, made themselves look great, come out with a killer deal and left the other guy with a half empty plate. Now, I was shocked at that mentality because that's not how I work. And even as a 34 year old, you know, fairly young professional, I found that offensive. And you know what? Those people who they nailed to the ground never came back. That's an ever diminishing circle of doing business. It's not win-win. It's quite the opposite. It's win-lose. Yeah. So everybody lost when that deal was done. And my colleagues were rubbing their hands with glee that they'd done this killer deal and come out on top. Because, of course, the next day, those guys on the other side were like, don't work with these people. They're schmucks. They're horrible mm -hmm. people. They're going to, you know, treat us badly mm -hmm. and they're going to run away with all the glory and leave us with nothing. So I mm -hmm. knew when mm -hmm. I was working in that environment, that I was going to lose my contacts and I was going to be contravening all my core values, which is best business is win-win business where everybody comes out on top feeling this is great. We've got a great deal on the right. They've got a great deal on the left. They've got a great deal. Let's make this one work and then let's do more. Let's come back and we'll do another one next year and the next year and the next year. And those returning clients, those are the most important clients on the planet. So that was a very, very difficult experience. I was offended by what I saw around that board table. And you know what? I left. I had to leave. And I thought, I can't keep working for people who I don't respect, who do not respect other people, and who, who frankly have a business model, which for me is completely a dead end. And uh, shortly after I left, they did go belly up. They didn't last mm. long. In fact, they, they collapsed. And I went on to run a very successful business. So, you know, I made the right decision. But how did you actually, so I want to talk a little more granular. That was a great story, by the way. I want to talk a little more granularly about that transition, because I would imagine, especially in, in, in your line of work, there's so much overhead and there's so many costs involved. You're obviously dealing with a lot of people. You need to deal with, um, you know, machinery and technology and, and, and all of this and, you know, get into a space which is occupied, I think by pretty large behemoths in many cases, what allowed you as an individual relatively young, still sort of, you know, finding your way to step into this space confidently, hopefully, or at least you step into it regardless and say, I can do this and I can be a player here. The creative sector is huge in the UK and the US. We employ millions of people, 9 million people in the US, 2 million people in the UK. And we're 5% of GVA in the US, 7% of GVA in the UK. We are huge economy drivers. So it's a very, very big industry. It is also, frankly, very uh, unhierarchical, which is a disadvantage if you're trying to get up a ladder it's not like accountancy or law where there's a natural progression it's an industry which does embrace individuals who've got an amazing idea or, or a great voice or something unique to say about the world so i took advantage of that and i'm not the only one there are many many people like me who have decided well you know what i've got an idea i've got a story to tell um, and I want to set up a business. And it is a sort of giant cottage industry in one regard. Yes, of course, at one end, you've got the giant studios, the Warner Brothers and Universal and all these other amazing uh, studios. And at the other end, you've got mom and pop one man bands. And then in between, you've got many companies such as mine. We are actually the largest independent group in the UK. Uh, but there are others similar to us who produce a broad range of television and uh, content across the different platforms. So um, there is a there is a trajectory for people like me to say, you know what, I've got an idea. Let me see if I can test this on the market. And then it requires a leap of faith. Uh, I was 34, 35. I was coming out of that business. I thought I can't keep working for these people. I've got to do something that has um, integrity. And I think I can do better than them, frankly because I'm a nicer guy and <laughs> frankly I think I'm a, I've got a better sense of business than they had um, and I went out and I tested the market I mean I took a room and a blank sheet of paper and a very smart guy who is my wingman and we did take a little investment at the beginning from another production company who also US UK but with a great lawyer who kind of built in a deal that was you know I'd take the investment at the beginning and then if we could pay them back after a while we could go um, solo which is in fact what happened um, and I just went out and tested the market. And I do think that if you are an entrepreneur and you, you have belief in yourself, 
I had a lot of experience as well. I'd been working for a lot of different companies. So I did have a lot of contacts and I know what makes a good show. Not always. Sometimes I get it wrong, but I do have some good ideas in the mix. Um, so I went out there and I tested it. And within, you know, a few weeks, I'd got a, a, in fact, my first show that I sold to the BBC was a documentary series called Monstrous Bosses and How to Be One, which looked at and drew on the experience I just had of Monstrous Bosses. And then the next show I went on was a, um, a big long running reality show called Cash in the Attic, which became a huge global phenomenon. And we sold it to 167 countries. And it's an entertainment wow. reality show about finding stuff in your home that you've forgotten about that actually is valuable. I have a whole I have a whole stash next to me that uh, I have to Excellent. one day unpack. I'm waiting for all my kids to get married. I could start divvying it out to them. Uh, you it's know, sort of funny. Like, <laughs> it's a, yeah, one, one of these days I'll actually be able to fit in there again. Anyway, I do want to talk before we before we transition to our next segment. I do have one final question, which I'll get to in a minute. But let's talk a little bit more about your book. What is the focus of it? Why did you write it? Who is it for? And what would you say is the core message of the book? Okay. Well, here is my book, The Flexible okay. Method, Prepare to Prosper in the Next Global Crisis. It's published by Nicholas Greeley, which is part of the Ashet Group, who are, you know, top five publishers in the world. Um, I wrote it to be purposeful because when we went into COVID in 2020, in those first lockdowns, it was terrifying. None of us knew what we were dealing with. Governments were frankly caught blindsided. And we as individuals and as families and as professionals were caught in this very, very shocking, terrifying place. And I know I was frightened. And I know in my business, we have a lot of people in their 20s living in apartments with poor Wi-Fi. They were frightened. Elderly people were scared. You know, we, we didn't have enough information at the beginning. So there was a real sense of scrabbling around in the dark not knowing what on earth we should do. Now, in my sector, the production sector, we were told back in March 2020 that all production had to stop completely and probably for a year. Now, if we don't produce, we have no income. We can't right. pay our bills. We can't pay our people. We can't put food on the table. It was cataclysmic, an existential threat to the business. And I was also very conscious of the fact that a lot of my people who were spread all over the world, some of them were on their own, some of them were frightened because they had a family member that was vulnerable. Some of them were in places where, you know, COVID was not being taken seriously, so were not being looked after by their governments. And I just felt a responsibility as a professional and a personal to start communicating. So I, start write, I started writing daily emails saying, the management team at Argonaut have your back. We are working really closely. We're working with every single government agency that will talk to us. We are looking at how we can possibly get back into production by setting up COVID protocols. We do not have all the answers and it is dangerous right now. So we want to make sure you are at home, that your loved ones are protected, that you've got food on the table. If you need help, reach out. We set up mental health support groups and what have you during that time. And as things progressed, we did actually get out of the gate far quicker than many of our competitors because my team knew that they were part of something bigger than them, that we cared about them. And people rolled up their sleeves and we came up with COVID protocols. And we uh, were the first out of the gate with a big drama for the BBC called Wurzel Gummidge about a magical scarecrow. We, came, we were first out of the gate with The Masked Singer, which is a big entertainment show for ITV. And we had no shutdowns. We got nobody sick. Everybody was protected. And we were back in business really within a few short months, far, far quicker than most of our competitors. So after that was kind of, you know, we're now in sort of November 2020 and we're getting back into the swing of things. Still a lot of pain. And my God, we had a lot of war wounds. Um, a friend of mine said to me, James, you know, like you and your team are doing quite extraordinary things. Why don't you write about this? Because it could be useful for the next generation coming down the track. So I, I reached out to an agent who thought the idea was interesting and invited me to make it much broader, much more than just about COVID, but also about the credit crunch and 9-11 and the California wildfires and Hurricane Sandy um, and recessions that we go through. You know, the, the first 20 years of the 21st century, we, we lurch from one crisis to the next, right? Um, and I also decided I would then reach out and interview leaders across many different industries. And one of the most fascinating was he's actually a Republican mayor in Oklahoma City. He's 40 years old. He's the youngest mayor in the U.S. and he's the first Native American mayor. Now, of course, the state of uh, Oklahoma, 
the governor didn't really believe in COVID. He didn't, you know, put too much uh, uh, in place. However, David Holt uh, felt very strongly that he wanted to protect his diverse community in Oklahoma City. And it is a very mixed and diverse community of people. And he has a strong social conscience. So he put, you know, shelter at home. He shut down bars and restaurants. He put a very stringent lockdown in place. And you know what happened? He had one of the lowest fatality rates in the whole of the US. I mean, it's terrible to talk about that as a success, but it is a success. Many, many other places, in fact, Oklahoma State had a far worse fatality rate because they didn't put their people first, in my opinion. But he did. And he said, you know what, I'm going to put my neck out. And he communicated very clearly. He really stepped up and protected his people and got really positive outcomes. He protected. And you know what? They had an election shortly afterwards and he won by a landslide. People want their leaders to protect them and to think about them and to put them first. So he was just one example of many. And I spoke to you know farmers in the, in the uh, Carolinas who deal with hurricanes on a regular basis. I spoke to people in real estate, in gyms, in healthcare, in hospitality. All the restaurants were shut down, weren't they? And all of these people in all these different sectors came up with really clever, practical ideas of how to get their people, first of all, safe and then back into work. So I wanted that to be in a book. And, you know, there will be other books like this coming down the track, of course. But hopefully now that people and I am getting some amazing feedback, we hit number one bestseller spot actually on Amazon uh, in the US and the UK. Um, so a lot of people from a lot of different sectors are finding value in the book. And that's why I wrote it. I wrote it to be useful. Mm, love it. So we are going to have to transition. But I, I asked this question of all of my guests. I know you've alluded to different pieces of it so, so far. But James, tell us, please. What would you say was the biggest mistake you've made and what have you learned from it? I'm really struggling with that one. Um, I'm very, I'm a very thoughtful person. I mean, I do make mistakes. I'm trying to think when, what would be a good answer? Gosh. As you're thinking, the reason I asked the question is because leadership, oftentimes people think that leaders are ready-made. You know, we come with all the answers. We're sort of wired in our DNA, genetically so that we have everything in place, but people don't see the struggles, they don't see the mistakes necessarily. And oftentimes those are the things that lead us to become better and become the kind of people that show up in the world. Yes, perhaps one of the things that I would say would be um, a mistake that I was able to correct, let's say, was um, when I went to the University of Oxford, um, this was 10 years ago, you know, as an adult, already running my group, um, they pointed out that founders think they can do everything and they think they can do everything better than anybody else. Now, I'm not kind of ego driven, but maybe at times I would think, well, I'm used to being a lone wolf and I can do everything. But actually, of course, one, we have particular strengths. We're not great at everything. And two, when you get bigger as an organization to try and do everything is a mistake. You become a bottleneck and a problem. So one of the things that I identified when I was at Oxford, that what I really needed to do was to get a chief operating officer, which I had never had before but somebody who would be able to run the day-to-day -day operations of the business, which would free me up to think about the vision and the strategy for the future. And as soon as I did that, I went out and I found this absolutely brilliant woman who is very detail-oriented, fantastically uh, uh, strategic about operations. And it meant that I could hand all of that over to her and I could then go and concentrate on how to grow the business moving forwards. I guess in retrospect, I had been doing her job and I can do that job, but actually the, 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 we'd outgrown it as a company and I, and I needed someone to tell me. And it was thanks to doing education that yeah. uh, someone did say to me, James, you know what? That's no longer fit for purpose. You need to bring somebody I love else it. in. We talk about it in my mastermind all the time. They need to delegate. They need mm -hmm. to take away the things that maybe you could do and even do well but shouldn't be doing because of the role that you occupy within your business, within your organization. So I love the answer. We're now going to transition to rapid fire where the answers are short and sweet. I know you love languages and you've learned many of them outside of English. What would you say? And maybe this is even a little bit skewed from an English perspective, but assuming for the moment that we all know English already, what would you say is the next most important language to be able to communicate with and be successful in the world at large? I think in the future, it's going to be Mandarin. Really? Interesting. What um, a type of all the different types of shows, you talk about different genres and whatnot, which one do you most enjoy producing? I love our investigative 
shows we work with the new york times and we actually worked on the epstein story for example Ooh. so we do break stories about miscreants and as part of the mix of what we do i'm proud of that work if you had one hour to meet anyone in the world and it could be a historical figure that you otherwise would never meet who would it be jfk nice is it easier to produce in new york or in the uk or in the uk or new, uh, the us or the uk Completely different. We speak the same language and we are totally different. But very we we but sort very of compatible. <laughs> okay. A not well known but cool aspect of living in London. Restaurants. Okay. The best known actor that you've ever worked with. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Whoa. And finally, a productivity tip that helps you to get more done. Get more sleep. Love it. Okay, so how can people connect with you, learn more about your work, access your book? Tell us more. Okay, well, I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn, so I'm really happy for people to reach out. I love interaction, and as I hope it's come across in our conversation today. Feedback is great. So if people do choose to pick up my book, The Flexible Method, which you can get on Amazon and Goodreads and good bookstores, then I would love to get your feedback. Please tell me what you think. And it's a book that's work in progress. You know, we will evolve it and make it better as time goes by. So please tell me your thoughts. Oh, I love that. Because oftentimes books feel like they're just a done deal. I'd love to see how you evolve this. And finally, uh, leave us, please, James, with one final life lesson. I think it's very important in this world to look after your mental health. And that means as leaders, we have to be mindful of not trying to do too much, not trying to work too hard, not trying to be all things to all people and try to foster a sense of kindness and calm because calm and purposeful leadership is so badly needed in the world that we live in today yes. and you cannot be a calm and purposeful leader if you are stressed and if your mental health is not in a good place awesome okay talk about ending on a high uh, really great conversation um very very much enjoyed every minute of it we will get all of those links in the show notes so everybody will be able to find you, interact with you. It's real, really been an absolute uh, delight and you've added so much value. So thank you, James. Continued success with all that you do. Keep inspiring your people, other leaders. And uh, I do look forward to deepening our relationship over time. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 